Now, as usual, you can get involved here from the top of the show. Send your questions or your comments through directly to me on Twitter, at Louisa Boyes. And it's always nice to have more voices than just those of us here in the studio. Now, a second televised debate on Scottish independence takes place on August the 25th, with less than a month to go until the referendum. The pro-independence vote continues to play catch-up in the polls, though it has seen a slight rise in support over the past week. After facing criticism for his first performance, the first First Minister Alex Salmon is expected to use the next debate to focus on key social issues like health care, for an example. Sam Bowman, he is the research director at the Adam Smith Institute, and he joins me. Welcome, Sam. Hi. So what do you think we're going to get out of the debate? What kind of a debate will it be? Well, at the last debate, the key question was currency. Alex Salmon has again and again tried been challenged on the question of what money is Scotland going to use if it goes independent. Ever since George Osborne ruled out the prospect of an official currency union and all of the other parties in the UK agreed, Alex Salmon has been reeling and looking desperately for a way to answer this question. He hasn't been able to do it yet. And this is what brought him low in the last debate, and it was widely agreed that he lost. I think this is going to come up again, and unless he does come up with a plausible um, way of convincing markets and convincing voters that Scotland will have a stable currency and a stable financial se sector, I think he's going to be in real trouble. Um, because looking at some of the latest research um, out via your institute, you, you, you say that an independent Scotland using the pound outside the currency union, that it actually could have a more stable financial system. That's right. Well, we've looked at dollarized economies in Latin America, so Ecuador, El Salvador, and Panama all use the U.S. dollar without a formal currency union. So they, they use it as legal tender and so on, but they don't have the Federal Reserve uh, acting as a lender of last resort to their banks. So what that actually means, and Panama is the best example because Ecuador and uh, El Salvador have only been using the dollar for about 10 years, mm -hmm. and they're very underdeveloped economies. But Panama is actually quite well developed. It's quite rich. It's a very strongly growing economy, not just now, but because of its services and financial sector as well. And Panama has used the dollar for 100 years. And according to IMF reports, the World Economic Forum, Panama has astonishingly stable banks. It has the seventh sta most stable banks in the entire world. And for a country, a middle-income country like Panama, that's something that we should really be paying attention to. So the reason for this is that Panaman banks know that they don't have this central lender of last resort to resort to if they do fall into trouble. So they're much more prudent in their lending than m most financial banks are. Mm. Because in this research, you also talk about how Scotland's successful history of free banking uh, in the 18th and the 19th centuries and the period of remarkable financial and economic stability uh, accompanying it along, uh, along that same time frame, you can't really compare it to now, can you? Because they didn't have Europe as we have Europe today. It was a, it was a very different Europe at the time. Well, it's true, but I think there are still some lessons that we can take from it. And actually, um, monetary economists and um, you know, economic historians of this period have looked at this period and suggested that there are a lot of lessons that we can take from it. And in the paper, we look at some of the uh, analogues that we can draw. So one good example is deposit insurance. Deposit insurance didn't exist at that time. Uh, it was shareholders who were liable if um, banks failed. So that meant that the owners of the banks had, had a huge incentive to make them act prudently. And crucially, bank customers customers had an incentive. Even though they would get most of their money back if the bank failed, they wouldn't get it all. So they did have some money on the line and they had an incentive to choose the safer banks. And the result was a very, very stable financial sector. The other interesting thing about Scotland, and during that period and still today, was that Scottish banks issued their own notes. And this is um, unheard of, except for Hong Kong and Northern Ireland. What we think would, uh, would happen would be that Scottish banks would continue issuing their own notes with uh, pound sterling reserves so that you could trade in a Scottish bank note to, to take an equal amount in pound reserves, but they'd be able to increase and decrease their balance sheets according to money demand. So that would mean that when there are um, periods of slowing spending and so on, banks would increase their balance sheets and you'd get a, this sort of automatic stabilizer that places like the Eurozone could with at the moment. How would trade work though, and especially again trade with, with broader Europe? Uh, I mean, Scotland, UK relies heavily on, on a relationship with the Eurozone. I think trade would be mostly unaffected, actually, because Scotland would still de facto be using the pound sterling. It wouldn't be an official um, arrangement, but they would, you, you as a, say, a British citizen going to Scotland would still be able to spend pounds. There'd be no reason for them to stop accepting them. In fact, that would actually be quite useful, to, that the foreign currency inflow would be quite useful to them. Um, so I think in general, the trade relationship with Europe and with the UK would be un, unaffected. What, what would be interesting would be how reliant would Scottish banks be on international markets when they ran into problems with uh, liquidity? There 
I think actually um, the, the past does not have very much to tell us because financial markets are obviously a lot more developed now. Now I think we might see that financial markets were able to act as essentially lenders of last resort to uh, Scottish banks. The upshot of all this though is that the Scottish financial sector will be a lot smaller than it is now and I think it's inevitable whatever currency option Scotland goes with that Lloyds and RBS will both domicile down to the, uh, down to the, to the city of London. This seems to be more to do with European regulation than the currency question and I don't think Alex Salmond has any way of keeping them there. The question I guess for Scottish voters is how many jobs would go with them? Certainly some but it would be very very costly for, for, for example for RBS RBS to move its call centre jobs, its trading market jobs and so on, all down to London and I don't know if they would want to incur that risk. Mm. And what happens, last but not least, with, with central bank policy? I mean, how, how can you be independent but still rely on a, on a separate central bank? Well, Scotland would basically be at the mercy of the Bank of England yeah. and would still be hoping for the Bank of England to um, manage the pound sterling relatively prudently, as, to be fair, the Bank of England has. It hasn't been perfect, but it's better than a lot of um, central banks. The interesting thing though is that if Scottish banks had this power to increase and decrease their balance sheets, basically they would have the control over the money supply in Scotland. And so you probably wouldn't get this kind of tight money problem that the Eurozone is experiencing at the moment because banks would be able to more notes pretty much at, at, at ease. The, what would be holding them back would be competition. If, if a bank was issuing too many notes, its balance sheet would become too risky and markets and so on would punish it. So banks wouldn't get into that position. I think finally, the interesting thing is when the countries that, that do this dollarization seem to have a similar they have a similar system, but their banks are so, are so stable because they have very, very large reserves. Panaman banks have about 30% reserves, which is far, far more than we have in most Western developed countries. So it does mean a smaller banking sector, but in the long run, it probably means more, sta more stability and more economic prosperity. Thank you very much for your views. Uh, very interesting stuff. Sam Bowman, Research Director at the Adam Smith Institute. Now, from Scotland to telecoms, Europe's top telecom operators, they could be set to battle it out over the Latin American market, as reports suggest that Telefonica and Telecom Italia, they're readying offers for Vivendi's Brazilian broadband unit. Reuters sources, they've reported that Telefonica will be...